Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another edition of Sports Talk Philadelphia here on LaSalle TV. We are well into the swing of things here in the second semester, so let's get right to it. Uh, we've got a great panel today. Isaac Perry returning, and we've got Kevin Cook and Steve Graham, of course, on the end of the desk. And we're starting things a little different today. We're talking LaSalle basketball. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. College basketball, it's not normally on here, but we kind of have a bias here at LaSalle TV. But they have a big, they had a big win the other night. So let's take a look at the graphic as they beat a uh, 20-slash-22 ranked VCU 74-69 in double overtime this past Wednesday. Of course, led by Jordan Price, 34 points, 64 points in his last two games, scoring all 12 points in that second overtime. Uh, guys, LaSalle's been streaky at best, and we'll get to that in a l little bit. But let's start off with... How big a deal is this win? Because, I mean, we'll talk about VCU's kind of woes in a second as well, but they beat a nationally ranked team. That's a big accomplishment, right? Yeah. I, any, anytime you, you defeat the top 25 team, that's always a big win. Um, obviously, Jordan Price got, got really hot. His second straight game with 30 points plus. His stats last night, 34 points, 18 rebounds, to five assists. That's, that's, that's definitely very motivational going forward. Yeah, it's, it's a really big one for this team. I mean, as you said, they've been inconsistent. And when you're able to get a, a win against a team that's nationally ranked, like it allows you to step back and look at the whole picture and say that we have a shot to play against these good teams. Steve? Yeah, this is the kind of win that propels you forward if you're going to make a run for the tournament. A top 25 team, and, and, and you could say VCU is out, Trevion Graham, who – who beat LaSalle in double overtime with 32 points last season. We got to see it at the Gola. But, but this is the kind of win that as the A-10's on the downfall and you don't see as many teams making the tournament this year, LaSalle can make a run at it, and this is the momentum you need. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a very good point in the fact that not only do they not, not have Graham, who averages about 16.7 points a game, but they also are with that without Briante Weber, who's out for the rest of the season with a knee injury. He only averaged 7.9 points per game, but his third all-time in NCAA history with 368 steals. So obviously, big loss there for the Rams. But, yeah, basically. But, I mean, they still, obviously, the Explorers still hung with them for or two overtimes. And again, yeah, they have those key injuries. But Steve, I'll start with you about this, and you kind of alluded to it. How much does that not matter for LaSalle's confidence? Because either way, you still got to win against the nationally ranked team. So, like you said, that's got to propel you going forward. Well, yeah, you definitely have that in the back of your mind that VCU is without these players. That's without us having Jarrell Wright or, or Jordan Price. But, but moving forward, you know, it, it's the same kind of basketball game. They're, they're ranked top 20, and they're still finding a way to win. They lost their last two VCU, but they're a sound behind Chaka Smart, a great head coach. They're a good basketball team. And, and LaSalle took it to him, double overtime, never let up, and Jordan Price came to play. Kevin, how motivating is this? It is, it is very motivating because when you, when you play a nationally ranked team, people know them, and this is going to be all over, that you beat a top 25 team. So for, a, for LaSalle's team, they know that they can hang with them regardless of the fact that they were down two players. Isaac? Anytime you win... Like anytime you win, it's always a good day, and, and especially with the season coming down to a to a close, it's always good to get hot like at this right time. And last last night's win will help do that. Yeah, I mean, let's look at uh, how they've been, how the Explorers have been doing so far this season. Like I said, a very streaky team at best, 14 and 10 overall, six and five in the Atlantic 10. Of course, anchored by Jordan Price, the transfer from Auburn, 17.3 points per game followed by Jarrell Wright with 11.8 points per game, and Steve Zach leading the team with 9.1 rebounds per game. Uh, this team, again, a lot of streaky parts. It almost seems like they're never on the same page, but when they ha have had moments of those glimmers, like at the Barclays Center Classic on Black Friday, they played Virginia, who's now one of the top five teams in the nation, and the second half, they almost beat them. They almost came back with just some missed free throws and missed opportunities at the end. So, Isaac, we'll start with you. Can this team get hot down the stretch? I believe they can. Um, but if you take a look at the, at the next three games they have, um, Davison, Ducoin, to St. Louis. Davison is 16 and six. Uh, Ducoin du is eight and 14, and St. Louis is 10 and 14. It's always good to win the games that, that you're supposed to win. And obviously the Davison game is going to be very tough knowing they're 16 and six. I think that LaSalle has a very good shot 
to go there and beat them and really make even more noise as March comes around. Kevin? Yeah, as Steve pointed out, the, that win the other night is the type of win that will propel you down the road. And with their uh, schedule upcoming, there's not that many tough games. So if they can maybe string together a win streak here, then they'll be sitting good. Steve, I mean, you just heard him say, hey. Yeah, there's games that we would think would not be tough games, but the Explorers have struggled with games like that this season. So do you think they can get hot? Well, seven games left. I think you need a minimum of six wins to have a shot at making the tournament. Um, you got a chance with the Duquesne, St. Louis, and Fordham. All three teams really struggling at the bottom of the conference. But you play St. Joe's again, Cross City rival, who's really picking up heat lately. You got Dayton again, who's just – it's a four-way tie for first in the conference. But I, I would give Dayton the best right now. I think they have the best all-around team. But, you know, miracles happen. And LaSalle could most certainly surge behind this win against – uh, VCU. Yeah, I mean, this win could easily be just like the Butler win they had a couple years ago. Of course, Butler came into the goal of ranked ninth in the nation. Then they were conveniently missing Rodney Clark, who was their main scorer. But they used that win, propelled, then went to VCU, won, and they never looked back. They made it to the Sweet 16. Yeah, so you need those things to happen. Just yeah. good luck. <laughs> so anything could and happen, and we'll see how LaSalle does down the stretch with A-10 play beginning to wind down as we creep towards March basketball. But now we're going to move on to the Wells Fargo Center, the Philadelphia Flyers. Of course, the Orange and Black, they have another team who's streaky and uh, another team who's dealing with another injury as we take a look at Steve Mason. Yup, he's hurt again, uh, injuring his right knee and really what was a freak accident during a timeout against, in a game against the Capitals last week, he was stretching, getting a drink of water, and all of a sudden he couldn't put weight on his right leg. He had to be helped off the bench. He will miss two to three weeks with arthroscopic surgery. Uh, guys, is this the final nail in the coffin for the Flyers since they've been on the outside looking in at the playoff picture for a while now? Do you think this will do them in and kind of just make them fade off? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, what was Steve Mason, this is his, his third injury in, le in less than a month. And when he's healthy, he's been well. Um, it's not like you had a backup goaltender that didn't know what he was doing. Ray Emery does know what he's doing. He's, he, he's been in the league for a very long time. And, and you know, but Steve Mason is, is a number one bona fide person, I mean goalie. So I think that we'll let him get through his three weeks. When he comes back, he'll be better than ever. It very well could be the end of their season, only because they, he was playing so well. And I mean, just last week we were saying how he was the most important player on that team right now. Yeah, that seems to be a pattern. Every time we talk someone up, it's we gotta stop doing Pavel that. <laughs> times. We got to stop talking people yeah. up. All right, so, but you were saying? So when you lose the guy who, to the city, could have been the most important player to make your run, like, that's very, like, uh, it makes you lose your, your confidence and your mojo moving forward. Steve, uh, a lot of talk has been in the Philly media this weekend, a lot of blogs and stuff about Steve Mason, about how, honestly, at this point, since the Flyers have been on the outside looking in for the playoff run, they should just let him sit for the rest of the year. You have Steve Mason. You have him for two more years after this year. You know what you've gotten him. And, again, this is the third time he's been injured this season. Should we just try to ice, ice him off and just let him get 100% for next season and let Ray Emery try to carry the load for a bit? Well, you have two arguments. Ron Hextall is still coming out and saying that we're not ruling Steve Mason out. Uh, and your backup, Ray Emery, is number one in the NHL with goal support. I think the Flyers average over three goals a game when he's in net. And the last game against the Canadians, Ray Emery proved to be a pretty good goalie behind the, you know, between the pipes. But a lot of this consistent play could, you know, if, if you still have some hope for the Flyers, I personally think it's, it's pretty much over for them and they should just, you know, go on cruise control. But still, you know, you could have Steve Mason come back. If Ray Emery can do his job, you know, things can happen. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And speaking of Ray Emery, let's take a look at it his stats, because he hasn't been terribly bad. Of course, the other night against Montreal, 39 saves on 41 shots. Again, really playing well. Those two goals were just kind of fluky goals that happened towards the end of the game and in overtime. But his overall record, 9-9-2 nine, nine, and two on the season, 3.25 goals against average and a .891 save percentage. Guys, how confident are you in Ray Emery starting for the Flyers these next couple weeks? I'm very confident. I mean, Ray Emery, the other night against Montreal, he did exactly what you wanted a backup goalie to do. He 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 did what allowed. What a starting goalie should do. Oh well, yeah, yeah, that too, because he he only um he 
say 39 to 41. He is capable of keeping them in the playoff race. Um, they are only eight games, I mean, uh, eight points out of the BFA. So, and with another month, month and a half to go, I, I really feel like the Flyers can't get it done. I mean, they beat the Rangers in a shootout back in 2010. They got them to the Stanley Cup and they had to crawl like crazy to get back in and they won it. So I think a lot they of can things went right then now. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Kevin? Um, after the other night's performance, I'm much more confident in Ray Emery than I was before. I mean, all season long, he was really wasn't doing that good of a job defending the other team. And uh, he's very slow moving side to side. But you didn't really see that problem with him the other night. Steve? Well, Ray Emery has a lot to prove in this consistent play. We'll, we'll show some improvement. But I think we might see a little bit of Rob Zepp bring him up from the Phantoms, too. And, you know, well, right now, Rob Zepp's hurt, too. Yeah, so Anthony Stolarz, the 20 year, one year old from New Jersey, by default, Ron Hextall had to call, call him up. So we better hope nothing goes wrong with well, Ray Emery. Yes, <laughs> all right, so it's all on Ray Emery. <laughs> yeah, let, no pressure. Oh, God, no, no pressure as the Flyers goalie. That, that's, yeah. that's just not real. That, well, the that, coach has great confidence in him, so, you know, he's. I don't think he has a choice. He's not well, going to be like, nah, <laughs> he, he's gonna have Ray Emery, else. nah, he's not. Could you imagine if Craig Ruby said that? How just destroy. If you're Ray Emery, that would destroy your confidence. <laughs> but anyway, let's get to a more encouraging story. Kimo Timonen, he's been out for most of the se all of the season so far with battling blood clots. Uh, but he started skating again this past week for the first time. Of course, last week he and Ron Hextall announced in a press conference in the middle of one, one of the games that he's attempting a comeback. And he wants to be back by the, by the end of this month. Guys, we all know how good of a story this is. Of course, Kimo timonen has been the Flyers' best defender for years now. Of course, a great, great guy that the fans like in the city. And we all like that he's showing the effort and he wants to be back. But with an injury like blood, like blood clots that's serious to your health, should he be trying to come back? Um, that's a very interesting question because I, I guess it would depend on where the Flyers were at. Um, if, if the Flyers like get any lower like 15 points out then I don't I really don't think it's much sense to bring him back what do you think yeah See, I don't know honestly like if I sorry if I can interject it for a sec honestly I don't know it's more on him because blood clots isn't just like a torn ACL or like a broken arm or something like that yeah. that's a yeah, pretty big health, can't feel health scare clot. so I mean obviously he knows his body well enough and good on him to try to make this decision but I mean I don't know again uh, he's on all he, those blood thinners as well. And not only that, but he said, too, that when he signed that one-year deal with the Flyers, that this is probably going to be his last year. I mean, how much, Kevin, I guess we'll start with you with this. How much does, do you think pride has uh, to do with this decision for Kimo? Do you think he just wants to end his career on his own terms? Well, I mean, you don't want to end your career on a bad note. So I think, I think he wants to give the Flyers some time, and, or the Flyers fans, some time to remember him as who he was and how great of a player he was for so long for this organization. Yeah, we'll see how Kimo he heals up. I mean, again, he just really wants to get out there and end this career on his own terms. I guess I can't blame him, but we'll see what happens with Kimo as he tries to get healthy by the end of this month. But we move on to the other team in the Wells Fargo Center, the Philadelphia 76ers, who, again, are a fun watch. So if, they're, you're on t if you're sitting around like a Monday night and you, something's on, a Sixers game is on TV, go ahead and watch a few minutes. They're a fun on team, but... Let's take a look at the, the big man, for at least the healthy big man, Nerlens Noel for the 76ers. 8.2 points per game in his rookie year, of course, missing last year with a torn ACL. 7.2 rebounds per game, 1.7 blocks per game. Uh, Isaac, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on the rookie so far? I think those numbers are, are exactly what I pictured him being, and he does lead all rookies some blocks as well. I think that that probably after his third year, you're really going to see exactly what Nolan Noel's um, the potential is. And, and plus on top of that, with his good play this year, he, he's going to be in a rookie, rookie sophomore game at a All-Star Weekend, which I think that's, that's very rewarding. Yeah, I, I'm, I agree. I think uh, his, he's, he's, came, he's come a long way over the course of just one season. So I'm excited to see how he's going to be as we progress further into this rebuild. He, his stats in the beginning of the season, well, not even just his stats, you could see he was playing like he was afraid of the competition. But recently you've seen him fight back and you know, kind of play a little bit dirty. And it's, it's nice to see that. 
So you think it would be much more ideal for this team if, if he could be developing himself, you know, next to Embiid. But, but developing by himself, I think he's doing exactly what the Sixers want. He's, he's playing very well defensively. He's got a lot to work on on offense. You know, last year when he was sitting out, you, you see, you know, the head coach shooting, you know, working on his form always. But you know, defensively, he's playing great. You, you always see these monstrous blocks he's getting and. There's a lot to improve, and when Embiid comes, you know, he's going to have to shift to being a power forward, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, But down the road, it's very exciting to see, see what, what he has to offer as a rookie. Yeah, I agree with you on some of the, those monstrous blocks. The Sixers Twitter handle, which I think is probably the best team Twitter ha handle on the city, every time Nerlens gets a big block, you always see the hashtag Nerlens block list, and they'll jokingly put up a player's Twitter that he blocks and says that it's about to block him on Twitter. So I, I think that... That's pretty ideal. But Isaac, you had another point about Noel? Yeah, I was going to say, too, um, in, in my opinion, there are two, two things that, that is stopping Nerlens Noel from really, really making a name for, for himself. I think that, one, his offensive um, prowess, I feel like if he gets that, that locked down, and if he puts the weight on, he only weighs 220 pounds. If he can get like within 240, 250 range, I think he'll be he'll be that much more effective because you're going up against guys like Dwight Howard, um, Marcus Gasol, and a couple other cats like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like a team like Cleveland that could put LeBron James at the four, at the four. I mean, next year, like Steve said, they're going to have to pop a Noel out the the power forward, and then Embiid will be at center. But what happens when you play a team like Cleveland and LeBron James is down there at the four? So. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I like what I'm seeing from Noel all so far, too. But, uh, again, he's still developing as, as a rookie. So we'll see how, how he looks. But now we move on to, I guess, more exciting matters? I, I don't know. The, the Sixers mascot. Let's take a look. Franklin the dog, ladies and gentlemen. A blue, um, I don't know what kind of dog. <laughs> but he can dunk a basketball. Uh, the motto for this when all the promos were happening was for the kids, by the kids. But guys, none of us are kids anymore, but what do you think of Franklin the dog? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm still on my hip-hop uh, thing from, from... That is better than hip-hop. That is a hundred <laughs> times better than hip-hop. I'm sorry. All right, yeah, Franklin got a little something, something. He got, you know, got swagger. He is blue. But, you know, I mean, I mean <laughs> that's something for the kids. That's something for the kids. Like you said, that's something for the kids. That, you know, he's, he's actually expected to make his debut at the All-Star break on February the 20th. So, so we'll see how, you know, how, how people adapt to him when we play the Pacers. Kevin? Yeah, I mean, like, like he said, it's for the kids. But, like, I mean, it's, he looks decent right now. But, um, well... <laughs> As far it's as like we're like evaluating an NBA, yeah, yeah. NBA like, prospect it's, it's right it's now, tough. he looks like, decent. As, as for me, I'd have to say that I'd have to wait and see how he dunks for, for me to give you my true <laughs> evaluation. <laughs> how he dunks on the Wells Fargo on, floor, on, yeah. Uh, on Franklin. Steve, uh, obviously I'm going to want your thoughts on this, but how, how important are mascots to in arena experiences? Because, I mean, there's some in the NBA, but, I mean, not as much as you, you would think. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's just all part of the entertainment aspect of going to a game, um, especially for the kids. You know, the motto really says it all. But a dog, I don't know. It's, just, <laughs> it's the 76ers. I don't really. It's it, better than Philly yeah, Moose. I guess you could. It is so much better than Philly um, Moose. People would disagree with that, but. <laughs> I know. Put talent on the floor. We need players. Like, we yeah. don't necessarily we don't need, need a mascot, mascot for players. Yeah. Yeah, but too I, bad we're not going to get there for like two more years. Well, someone who is concerned about the Sixers mascot, for some reason, even though he's a professional NBA player, is Robin Lopez of the Trailblazers. Look, look at this Twitter exchange. Robin Lopez, who has a history of getting into it mascots for some reason, says, you've got some time to prepare yourself at Sixers Franklin, or you could be smart and walk away. To which Franklin, yes, he has a Twitter account, at Sixers Franklin, responds and says, there's no turning back, and posts a gif of Morpheus from the Matrix saying, bring it on. If the Trailblazers play the Sixers at home next season, this has to be the most intriguing matchup of the Sixers season, right? All I got to say, I just got to say one thing. Oh, I no. take $10 Franklin Beast, Beast, Beast <laughs> Lopez, $10 on it. I don't Kevin. know if this is the most intriguing, but it'll probably be the funniest. It's, something's going to be the funniest, Steve, real yeah. quick. Yeah, I think if Franklin doesn't throw some hay balers, he'll be gone. <laughs> oh, God. We'll, we'll it's going to be like Gronk in the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Just going to throw some haymakers. Yeah. But anyway, now we move on to Philly's talk. Of course, Philly's still in off-season mode, still are the Phillies. So, uh, I mean, take that for what you will. But now James Shields, 
uh, signs with the Padres this week. Uh, of course, the, he helped out Kansas City a lot. At, but the Padres were a team where Cole Hamels was rumored to go. Now that they signed James Shields, that's not going to be the case. Um, Jim Salisbury talked to Ruben Amaro earlier this week saying that um, four teams have made serious offers, whatever that means, uh, for Cole Hamels. But he expects Cole to be uh, in camp with the Phillies by the time it start, or it's, uh, by the time spring training starts. Excuse me, Isaac. Uh, do you like that Ruben's waiting for the absolute right deal, or do you think it's kind of like what happened at the trade deadline, where he waited a little too long to move Marlon Bird, and the Mariners backed off, et cetera? Don't unload, unload people for the sake of just unloading them. It's not like Cole Hamels is on the decline. So yes, I do a, agree with Ruben. Like don't. Don't trade him for the sake of trading him. Wait for right. the right offer, you know, and then you go from there. Yeah, yeah. you don't, you don't want to undersell one of your players. I mean, he's a homegrown talent. So I think that, like, you really want to get as much as you can. But at the same time, you don't want to hold on to him for so long that people aren't going to stay talking to you. Yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, Pat Allen of Phillies Nation wrote a really good article saying that it's good to at least ho hold on to him for now. Again, you don't have to rush trading him right right away, just mainly because this is your big course. This is the team, this is the guy that teams are most interested in, and that could bring the best back to your, your exactly. franchise. So this either has to be a gr grand slam or it can't be anything at all. You mm -hmm. can't just sell for a deal that, yeah, it might be okay. Obviously, we've talked about this before on desk, but this can't be the Cliff Lee trade to Seattle. It can't be that, because no. obviously- You need something in return. Yeah, This This is your future, what you're getting back for him. You're absolutely right. and. Uh, so now we move on to this past week, uh, newly promoted uh, Phillies chairman David Montgomery making a statement saying that Ruben Amaro Jr. would be evaluated after a year or two. Um, a little interesting considering, of course, the past couple years people have been calling for his head. Isaac, faithfulness has been the Phillies' M.O. Do you like how faithful the Phillies' front office has been with Ruben Amaro Jr.? When was the last time the Phillies made the playoffs? 2011, correct? Uh, yeah. So... One more year for, for Ruben because we can't go One through. One more full season. Yes, yes. Okay. Because the, the Phillies, for the better part of, of the 2000s, they were the team to be. And now since they slipped over the last couple of years, we can't let that continue much longer. So give them one more season, then we'll see where we go from there. Kevin? Um, yeah, I mean, we were just talking how he doesn't want to give, like he doesn't want to give up Cole Hamels for nothing. So what we need is we need, I'm like, I'm happy that they're faithful to him, but we need to make sure that he's not taking too long. Like, I'd, I'd be more comfortable knowing if, like, someone like Pat Gellick was watching over his shoulder, making sure that he wasn't giving up deals that really are what we are looking for Well, I mean, right Pat now. Gellick is team president now, so if he's not doing yes. that, he's not doing his job. Steve, real quick. Yeah, I think we saw... You know, it's no surprise that he's going to be around. There's, there's, you know, Philly faithful, and it stays that way in the front office. But a little concerning is just the same philosophy that's going to stay in office of keeping these older players that it hasn't worked. You know, it worked in 2008, and, you know, the, the city rejoiced. But moving forward from there, there's just there's better moves that I think a different general manager could make. You know, that's a good point. So, again, we'll see how the Phillies are. They report to spring training in a couple weeks. So let's see what happens with the fight in Phils or formerly fighting Phils. But anyway, it's fast time, five time, of course, our favorite part of the show. So we're going to start with Kevin Cook this week. Kevin, what's the best Phillies game you've ever been to and why? Uh, I was at a couple of good games. Um, I saw Moyer throw, well, pitch a no-hitter through six, but I think my favorite was a couple years ago, Placido Polanco beat out an infield single for a walk-off. and that. Oh, was that against the Rockies? Yes, it was. Yeah, I remember Scudero that. Scudero had yeah, a, a, a bad throw across. Todd Helton missed the bag, exactly. which Todd Helton would never do. I remember that game. All right, uh, Steve, according to Crossing Broad a few weeks ago, Citizens Bank Park was voted the best food of all Philly st uh, stadiums by a long shot. So what's your favorite thing to eat at a Phillies game? Uh, Chickies and Pete's crab fries and that. a cheese steak as well. Tony Luke's. It's just oh, yeah. delicious. Oh, yeah, that, that's a safe bet. Now I'm hungry. I don't know why. I don't know why I asked this question. Uh, anyway, Isaac, the Sixers have no All Stars this year. Again, who was the last Sixer to play in an All Star game, and what year was it? 
five, uh, four. Andre Iguodala in 2012. Not, nope, not that far back. Drew Holiday, 2012, 2013. Yes, he did. So, yes, he did. You're right. Yes, he did. Wah, wah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, you're right. Kevin, uh, we've been talking about Cole Hamill's trade rumors a lot. Uh, when Cole takes the mat at Citizens Bank Park, uh, his warm-up song is Thunderstruck by ACDC, a classic, if I do say so myself. What would your warm-up song be if you were a starting pitcher? Uh, I mean, I listened to uh, some Eminem when I warmed up in high school. So I guess like Lose Yourself, maybe Cinderella Man would be a good one too. Both good choices, both really good <laughs> choices. That would probably be mine. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I think I'd rather be a closer though and have something like just... Enter Sandman? Maybe something along those lines. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> All right, and lastly, ignoring that, Isaac, on a scale of 1 to 10, and this is real quick, how amazing was KJ McDaniel's self alley-oop against the Warriors the other night? Wasn't that awesome? 10, because he did it in the game, yeah. All right, that, I don't know, I'd say about an 8 or a 9. All right, but that, that does it for us this week here on Sports Talk Philadelphia. But, of course, you can always hit us up on social media. We're there, Facebook, Twitter, the lot. You can watch our episode, full episodes on YouTube. Oop, you can see all of our smiling, bright faces talking about what great state Philadelphia sports are in right now. So you can catch us all around there on social media for Steve, for Kevin, and for Isaac. I'm Tyler Harper. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time. See you.